Um, you know, while there certainly is a lot of art uh, to making polyurethanes, there definitely is uh, some, a lot of science to it as well. And I'm here to, to uh, teach you the science part of it. Uh, the, the magic part, uh, I think you'll have to learn uh, along the way. So the training topics for today, I'm going to start out with, um, you know, talking about the, the chemistry for the flexible foam. So many of what I'm talking about today can apply to other types of polyurethanes, but it, it may not. And when there's differences between the flexible area and some of the other areas like rigids or elastomers, I'll try to point them out. I'm going to start out with, uh, you know, just a brief overview of the chemistry of foams, and then talk about all the different the raw materials that go into making a, a polyurethane foam. And, um, so, so a lot of material to, to cover. We're going to be trying to move uh, fairly quickly, but uh, you know there will be time for questions either uh, at the end or at the intermission. And I'm I'm here for the whole conference. So start out with uh, what is a, a, a polyurethane. So uh, by definition, a urethane is a chemical that has this structure here, uh, NH uh, carbonyl oxygen. It's also called a, a carbonate uh, structure. Um, and uh, the, the most practical commercial route to forming that uh, structure is by the reaction of an isocyanate with an alcohol. Um, polyurethane, you see, have been invented about 80 years ago by Otto Bayer. So they've been around for quite a long time, but there's always continued new development in the technology. To make the, the polymer, you need a, a multifunctional isocyanate and a multifunctional alcohol, which is called a polyol. So shown here is a reaction of, of a TDI with a, with a, with a diol, would give you this linear type polyurethane structure. So there's uh, two basic reactions in polyurethane uh, foam chemistry. That reaction that I just talked about, the isocyanate reacting with the polyol to form the urethane, is called the gel reaction. Um, it, what it's doing is it's really, this is building the molecular weight and it's creating what we call the soft segments, which I'll explain further in a minute. There's also another uh, reaction called the blow reaction that generates the carbon dioxide gas to turn that polymer into a, a foam material. So the blow reaction is, is react isocyanate with water. It forms this unstable carbamic acid intermediate that loses carbon dioxide to form the amine. Well, isocyanates are very reactive material, will react with anything with an active hydrogen, so that amine that's generated will react with additional isocyanate to form a urea. So this is called the blow reaction because it liberates the carbon dioxide to cause the foaming, and this creates what's called the hard segments of the, of the polymer. Both of these reactions uh, involve a, a significant amount of heat that we'll talk about later as well. And um, foam formation uh, requires really a balance between these two reactions, that you have to balance the rate at which the blow reaction and um, the, the, the gel reaction occurs. The blow reaction typically predominates in the early stages, the gel later on as, as the foam is, is, is rising, and through, through the choice of the polyols and the catalysis is how you control that uh, reactivity balance. Isocyanates will also undergo a number of, of side reactions. As I indicated, they can react with anything with an active hydrogen, so that urethane structure uh, has an active hydrogen as well as the ureas have active hydrogen. So if isocyanate reacts with the urethane, it forms what's called an olefinate, with the urea is called a bi, uh, biuret. And um, typically these are happen more at the, when there's excess isocyanate there, and uh, notice that these reactions are reversible uh, under the heat. There are a number of other uh, urethane uh, reactions that the isocyanates undergo. Most of these are really not applicable to polyurethane flexible foam, uh, more for some of the other uh, foam or elastomer technologies and, and coatings, but just wanted to make you aware of them. So if you think about uh, polyurethanes as, as, a, as a network, um, they're, uh, for, for the flexible foam, it's a thermal set as opposed to a, a thermoplastic type polymer. And you have alternating linkages of where the isocyanate was to form the hard segment. 
and the long flexible polyol chain. There's really not uh, drawn to, to scale here. But the most common isocyanate for uh, flexible foams is TDI, so it's a difunctional material. The most common polyol is a, is a glycerin initiated. So you can see that the, most of the linkages for that polymer network are created through the polyol side rather than the isocyanate side. Again, thinking of that um, isocyanate uh, uh, polyol water reaction, you're forming a, you're forming a urethane urea block copolymer. You have that polyol, which is that soft, flexible segment, and then the hard segment that's coming from uh, the urea uh, you know, water reaction. So the soft segment, what it does is it imparts that elasticity, the flexibility, and the resiliency to, to the foam. The hard segment, um, and you see how, how uh, because of all the, the, the high, you can get a lot of hydrogen bonding, that those hard segments kind of align together. And those hard segments impart that rigidity, the hardness, and the flex modulus, as well as the, the high temperature property uh, for the polymer. So I think most people will say they probably know what a, what a foam is, but here's the definition that, uh, you know, you have air or gas bubbles that are trapped inside a solid or liquid. So flexible foam is obviously the solid, but it starts off as a liquid. And what happens as you go from that liquid phase to becoming a solid is important, and we'll talk about that, that later on. But the two main types of um, cellular foam uh, are either a, an open-celled foam or a closed-cell foam. Closed cell foam is, is the, more the rigid type foam. The flexible foams are the open type cells. So when, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the mechanism later on for the cell formation, but when those bubbles pop, those cell uh, windows will drain into form what's called the, the struts or the cell walls. Um, and some type of foams, um, uh, you know, they, they open, uh, you know, by themselves and with Certain foams, like the uh, high resiliency or molded foams, they have to be mechanically crushed to give them that open cell, uh, you know, structure or nature to it. But having that open like that, what gives it the flexibility and high uh, airflow. So besides the whether the foam uh, was open or closed, the other variables are things like what is the cell structure like, whether it's a, it's a fairly regular cell. Um, as, as it typically is for conventional and viscoelastic foam, where uh, high resiliency foams typically have a very irregular cell structure. Other variable here is, is often people count how many cells per inch there are. So, uh, you know, by the fineness of the cells will also affect the foam, foam properties. There's another type of, uh, of foam out there called reticulated foam. It's typically made by, from a conventional foam through either chemical or mechanical degradation uh, to produce the very large cells. And that's used for uh, applications like filters or maybe you know, outdoor furniture where you need very super high airflow or water to, uh, to easily drain from, from that. So flexible foams can be classified in a number of different ways. The first is primarily the process that's made, whether it's made by a slab stock, or, or molded te technique can be classified by some performance property. Typically, the, 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 the two main uh, performance characteristics are, are density and uh, IFD, which is indentation force deflection, how much force it takes to uh, compress the, the foam. Three main uh, classes of, of foams that we'll talk about are conventional foam, high resiliency HR, or viscoelastic or memory foam. Uh, some people also can classify foams by, you know, the end-use uh, application as, as well. You'll learn more about the specifics of uh, the, in the foam process in the later uh, section, but just uh, basically uh, point out that most flexible foam is made by a continuous process where the polyol and all the ingredients are kneaded separately to a mix head, along with the isocyanate separate into a, a, some type of lay-down, uh, continuous pour process. You can see it can produce pretty large uh, size, size buns. Um, and uh, flexible foam is made this way as opposed to most other type of foams because of the, the large volumes and everything and a lot of other systems area. 
all these components are often uh, pre-blended. So that's a distinction of uh, flat top foam production. You can also, um, essentially, if you're making flexible foam in the lab, you're mixing all the uh, components together in a small container and then just dumping it into a, a small uh, box or, or open um, bucket and allow it to, uh, to free rise. A larger version of that is called the box foam production. Uh, essentially, it's, a, it's more of a batch process. That's still practiced uh, today, um, mainly by either sm very small companies or mainly in developing uh, nations. So you still can produce foam uh, that way. Molded foam, as the name implies, uh, is uh, poured into a mold. And again, you'll, you'll hear more about the, that in the, in the later sections. But that's how like a molded sheet or a molded pillow is, is, is made. Talk about the uh, flexible foam uh, grade. They said um, the two main characteristics are, are, are density. Flexible foam can go anywhere down from about a half a pound uh, or a pound per cubic foot up to about eight pound per cubic foot for some viscoelastic foam. Generally, the higher the density, the better the quality of, of that foam. The other uh, variable was the firmness, which is the indentation force deflection. Um, how much force it takes to, to compress that 25%. So you can go from sort of, you know, very, very soft from a, from only five pounds up to a very, very super firm foam that might be used for like a packaging type application. And very, a very common technique a lot of people use when they refer to the, the grade of the foam is they'll use the first two digits refer to the, the, the density and the second two refer to the, the firmness. So 1015 means a one pound foam, 15 IFD, or you can have a one pound foam with a 30 IFD, or keep, keep the, the IFD constant and have a 25, 30, just a higher density foam. That's a common technique uh, a, lot of, a lot of people use. Um, as well as, again, you know, other, other techniques, you know, refer more to the end uh, application of the foam. What I want to do uh, is, is try to explain a little bit of the differences between uh, conventional and a high resiliency and then a, then a, a memory foam. So um, an HR foam, uh, high resiliency, as the name implies, has the, the, the very high resiliency greater than 55% compared to conventional uh, foam, which is the lower resiliency. But also more important and why it's good for uh, a seating application is what's called the, the sag factor. And um, what the, these curves over here, these charts, is, is plotting indentation force deflection versus compression. How much force it requires to compress the foam to a certain degree. So in a conventional foam, you can see there's a very steep initial curve here. And so what that means is it takes a lot of force to compress the foam a little bit. And then you have that flat plateau here where very little change in force has a big effect on how much foam that, that compresses. As a result, that a person or somebody with a, with a very little weight doesn't have enough force to compress it is sitting on top of the foam. Something with, with higher weight really compresses it and the foam is said to bottom out. Whereas if you look at a similar stress strain, uh, you know, indication force deflection curve for a HR foam, you see it's, it's a much um, more more uh, linear type and in, in flatter in this range uh, and it's changing, changing linear here rather than that, that flat slope. So what that, that means is, is that you know a person with a, with a light weight as well as a heavy weight can both be sitting inside the foam uh, rather than on top or bottoming out. And that all has to do with going back to that irregular cell structure I told you about for the HR type foam. The sag factor or uh, the force factor is taking the 65% IFD over the 25%. So the HR has a higher higher ratio indicating the better support. And the difference between the loading curve and the unloading curve is called hysteresis. Most people probably know what uh, viscoelastic or, or memory foams are. Seems like it's um, you know, all the new, uh, you know, bedding and the toppers, uh, the bed in the box type applications are all based upon viscoelastic foam, although it's been around for, uh, quite a, quite a long time. 
But uh, these type of foams delivered uh, exhibit what's called the time delay response. So when, when uh, typically when you can compress a, a conventional foam, it springs back essentially immediately. Whereas in a viscoelastic foam, you know, it takes it takes several seconds for that foam to fully uh, recover or respond. They typically have very, very low re uh, resiliency to them. And the properties of the uh, viscoelastic foams are most often associated with the glass transition temperature of the polymer, and they target it to be around room temperature. And if you can think of the glass transition temperature kind of as a sort of a softening point for that polymer, you know, at temperatures below um, the glass transition temperature, that the foam, the polymer can be very hard. Above the glass transition temperature, it becomes very soft. So by targeting it to have a glass transition temperature around room temperature, as you, as you lay on it, the foam uh, picks up your body heat and sort of softens and molds uh, into the, you know, the, the shape of, of, of your body. And uh, these can be made by either a continuous or, or a molding process. Another difference between the, the three um, types of, of foams is the, the, the type of reactivity um, this is a graph of um, how much the foam is, is rising as a function of time. So when you mix it, you dump it into your box or, or bucket, and you, you measure with some sonar or something like that, that rate of reactivity. HR foams react uh, the fastest than conventional. Viscoelastic foams tend to be very extremely slow. And as we uh, start to talk about the chemistry of the raw, the raw materials that go into it, you'll understand maybe why we uh, see these differences in the reactivity curve. So if you look at a typical polyurethane uh, foam formulation chemistry, uh, why this, this came out to off center here, but uh, it starts out with typically 100 parts of, uh, of uh, your polyol, your polymer polyol is always 100, and then all the other additives typically are based upon that 100 parts of, of, of the polyol. And um, lastly, then the, your, your other component is your, uh, your isocyanate. Uh, and you see, depending upon the index uh, and the type of foam you're making, that can only be a, a small fraction of, of the total amount of uh, material that goes into, into a foam. So index is uh, the ratio of the amount of isocyanate that's needed to react with all the hydroxyl groups that are present in your foam formulation. The hydroxyls from, from the polyol, from the water, from, from any other additives, cross-linkers. And a, a hundred index is essentially an equal balance that is stoichiometric. It's one-to-one -one iso uh, to, to polyol. Uh, and, other reactive materials. When um, 110 uh, index means I have, say, 10% more isocyanate than is needed, that isocyanate will still react. And what it will do is uh, do some addition, maybe cross-linking or other reactions. And um, versus if you, if you say, 95 index means uh, you, have, you don't have enough isocyanate so you may not get the, you know, the, the full range of properties, but varying that index is a very common technique that people use to try to uh, change uh, pop, the, the, the properties of the foam, mainly the, the, the hardness, by manipulating that, that index. Again, it's just the, the, you know, the ratio of, of uh, isocyanate to uh, all the reactive groups. Now we're going to start talking about all the individual components that go into making the, uh, the flexible foam, starting out with the, uh, the polyols. Um, and as, as you can see in, in the, um, uh, the, um, one of the earlier slides, uh, you know, the main isocyanate that is used is, is TDI. Um, whereas um, polyol, there's, there's a lot of uh, handles or different variables. So most of the functionality and changes that occur occur more on the polyol side than on the isocyanate side. So by definition, again, a polyol is just a substance with more than one hydroxyl group. It typically refers to materials with, say, a molecular weight that's greater than about 250. 
when it's when it's small, low molecular weight, they're usually called uh, you know cross linkers or chain extenders or, or those type of materials. There's two main classes of um, polyols used in flexible foams. The largest is uh, the polyether polyols, and then there's also polyester polyols. There's a whole variety of other types of, of uh, polyols out there, but uh, almost uh, none of them are really used in um, in flexible foams. They're used a lot more in uh, elastomers and coating type, type applications. So if you look at this polyol structure in here, you have some type of starter uh, molecule, and then you have a number of, of arms going off. So the variables for the, on the polyol side can be the, the composition, what oxide was used along those arms, whether those N groups, those OH groups, are primary or secondary, uh, the functionality, in other words, how many arms uh, are there, um, the, the molecular weight or the chain length uh, can, can be varied, as well as the catalyst or the process that was used to, to manufacture that polyol. So as I said, there's a lot of variables here, um, much more so than on the isocyanate side. So just going through some of those things we talked about, the, the two main epoxides that are used are propylene oxide and ethylene oxide. And uh, so you start out with the alcohol. If you use propylene oxide, you generate a secondary hydroxyl. If I use ethylene oxide, I generate a primary hydroxyl. And the difference between the two is, is the, the, the propylene oxide is what gives the, the polymer some, uh, some flexibility, but um, it's going to make it react uh, slower when if it's at the end of the molecule. The ethylene oxide, if it's at the end, will uh, make it react faster, but uh, generally people also put it internal because it helps with um, compatibilization with the water that's in the molecule. This uh, slide here shows the effect of that primary hydroxyl on reactivity. What uh, we're, we're plotting here is, is, a, is a viscosity build as a function of time. The faster that rate of reaction, the higher the, that, the faster that viscosity is going to build as a function of time. And what this is, is trying to show is that even small differences in the amount of primary going from 75 to 80 to 85 really will affect that, that rate of reactivity. So uh, it's something to, to be aware of there. So some of the other variables on the, the polyol synthesis side are the amount of oxide used. The more oxide that, that's added per starter, the longer that, that chain length. A conventional polyol is typically three to 4,000 molecular weight and usually based upon a glycerin starter. Molded and HR polyols are higher molecular weight and their functionality can be three or sometimes higher. Just elastic polyols are often the, the, the lowest molecular weight and uh, sometimes have functionalities of, of less than three. And some examples of what some of the typical uh, starters are, if you wanted to make a dial, you might start out with something like protein glycol. Glycerin is the most common trial starter. If you want to make higher functional materials, um, these are the mo most two uh, common ones, sucrose and uh, sorbitol, for flexible foams. For rigid foams, there's, there's probably a whole laundry list of different type of, uh, of starters for, to make other type of uh, polyols. So the, um, you can add those oxides in, in almost any uh, imaginable way uh, you can think. You can start with initiate and just put pure propylene oxide, or I can make a mix of propylene oxide and EO where the EO is on the end, whether it's internal or whether it's a block. So there's, there's a lot of variability there to, to make sort of, uh, you know, unique structures for, for different type applications. So, um, the, the most common, uh, conventional is, uh, you know, more like this mixed tube with a PO, PO cap is the most common conventional. The most common, um, uh, like HR usually puts, uh, ethylene oxide at the end and having that ethylene oxide at the end, given that primary is why in that reactivity curve, it's the fastest to, to, to react. So, as you say, typically you're putting in more PO, if you want to make a more hydrophobic type material, you're putting the EO as a cap to make it more reactive, you're putting it internally for, for water compatibility, 
and then you're, you're again also varying that molecular weight and functionality. And then uh, viscoelastic elastic is the lowest molecular weight, and uh, HR is, is the highest molecular weight. If you're making a more of a, a rigid type, you're, you're going to even have uh, even, even lower lower molecular weights and much higher functionality. But mentioned that the other variable on the polyol side was the catalyst that was used to manufacture uh, the material. The traditional catalyst was uh, been KOH been uh, you know used for uh, for over 60 years, and um, one of the the, the, the challenges or the difficulties with the KOH is it's a it's a very slow you can only make it by a batch, and you have to at the end uh, refine or remove that 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 KOH. Um, a newer technology that um, has been around uh, probably though for about at least 20, 25 years now is called impact or double metal cyanide or some type of organometallic catalyst. So instead of uh, you know large weight percent of the catalyst, you're using more like PPM levels. Uh, it results in an in improved efficiency, environmentally friendly process. It can be made not just by batch but also by continuous and um, you know, uh, you know, increased productivity, reduced waste, but also, more importantly, better side reaction, uh, uh, minimal side reaction versus the KOH that leads to higher quality polyols. So, uh, with the KOH, propylene oxide can isomerize to form allyl alcohol. Allyl alcohol contains a, a hydroxyl group, so it will react with more oxide to form a long chain monol. Or, uh, or also called unsaturation. So this monol, if you're trying to make a triol and you have this monol in there, that monol is a chain, chain stopper, so it, it doesn't uh, allow you to, to build molecular weight. So you don't get this side reaction with the uh, impact of the double metal cyanide process. And this is illustrated here in, um, in this slide. So as um, the amount of monol uh, that's formed by KOH Increases as the hydroxyl number decreases, or, or this is um, the molecular weight increases. We'll talk about hydroxyl number here in a minute. But um, whereas you can see in the impact of the double metal cyanide process, that amount of, of, of monol or unsaturation is constant regardless of the molecular weight you're trying to produce. And uh, what that means, uh, in effect, if um, most conventional polyols are about a 56 hydroxyl, so uh, you can see uh, 56 hydroxyl has an unsat of 0.03. If I convert that unsat to the amount of monol and the functionality, instead of making a, 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 a three functional, I'm only now at a, at a 2.7. And if uh, I'm trying to make an HR polyol that's more like down here at 28, I'm twice that level, so I'm only at 2.5 functionality. So you're not, you know, so when we, talk, we typically talk about functionality, we're typically talking about the nominal functionality of the starter, but what's also important is what is the true functionality, and by using that uh, uh, new technology, the impact, you can make a much higher functionality, much more uh, close to the theoretical type um, of functionality, uh, regardless of the hydroxyl number. So um, at the, you know, the last stages on the, on the polyol manufacturer, as I mentioned, if it's made by KOH, and a lot of products today still are, uh, you have to remove that potassium down to a, a, a few ppm. Uh, and um, there's a lot of different refining uh, techniques for removing that potassium. And um, many of them will leave behind different sort of cats and dog trace uh, type impurities, which can, can often affect uh, reactivity. So people sometimes say, well, as which one 3,000 molecular weight polyol for another, and they're seeing a reactivity difference. It can also it often be due to those those you know impurities that, that are that are present in the. As I mentioned the DMC uh, polyols don't need to be refined; you just can leave the, the, the catalyst uh, in, in them. Then the, the last step is to add uh, antioxidants to help stabilize the polyol itself against uh, oxidation as well as when you go to make foam to prevent uh, foam scorch or, or fires. So what are the important uh, parameters to, to know or understand if you're working with um, polyols? They say, you know, the, 
the hydroxyl number, again, we'll talk a little bit about uh, exactly what that is, but um, you know, it, it's basically an indication of, of the hydroxyl content that you need to know for reacting with the isocyanate. Polyols are very hydroscopic, so they will definitely pick up moisture, so you have to you know, keep them um, inerted for both uh, picking up moisture as well as be aware of what that moisture content is for reacting uh, with, with the isocyanate. And uh, if it, if it, you know, they can are also susceptible to, uh, to oxidation, again, why you keep, the, keep them need, uh, needed under a nitrogen blanket, so that you're not forming peroxide uh, or any color bodies or odor type materials that can affect uh, you know, reactivity or foam performance. Again, uh, if, you're, if you're dealing with a KOH polyol, you need to worry about is there any uh, uh, acidity or alkalinity remaining in the product. And um, also you need to know for, for the viscosity of what that polyol is for when you go, uh, you know, it will affect your, your mixing capability when you go into uh, in production. So as I said, hydroxyl number is an indication of the amount of of, uh, of N groups or hydroxyl groups present uh, in, the, in the material. Uh, it's calculated using this formula here, and uh, the 56 um, uh, point, uh, 50, the molecular, it's by, done by a titration method with KOH, and the equivalent weight of KOH is 56.1 times 1,000, is, is why you get this uh, 56,100 uh, times the functionality over the molecular weight. The relationship is just the equivalent weight uh, is equal to the molecular weight or the functionality. Some examples are shown down here, and you can see if you can take this molecular weight, divide by the functionality, you get the equivalent weight for all of these. But if you have, if you know the the the, the, the hydroxyl number and you know the theoretical uh, functionality, you can calculate the equivalent weight and molecular weight. So as you see, if you had a 56.1 a thousand molecular weight equivalent weight and three functional is going to be a three thousand molecular weight. If, if it, you had a twenty uh, eight point two, uh, it's going to be three functional. It's going to be twice that equivalent weight. You can also have a twenty six point two hydroxyl, but if the functionality is two, it's the same equivalent weight, but the molecular weight is uh, two thirds of, of uh, the six thousand. Again, the you know short short chains are you know, so the, the the lower um, the hy the hydroxyl. There's also some other type of uh, polyols out there that are used. Um, one class is the natural oil polyols. Um, the two main natural oil polyols are castor oil. Castor oil already contains hydroxyl groups on it. The other is soy-based uh, polyols. Soy polyol uh, the, the soy oils contain unsaturation, so the producers have to convert the double bond into an epoxide and open the, uh, the epoxide to form the hydroxyl groups. Um, so that's a multi-step step process. And some of the things to be uh, aware with the, the soy polyols is, um, you know, uh, potential uh, odor concern, uh, and, and that odor can vary from sort of uh, production process uh, to, to production process. And um, also, uh, they tend to ha have a slightly acidic character to them, so that might uh, affect the reactivity. But um, people are, are using them uh, in some formulations to, uh, to be more environmentally uh, friendly. But typically, the amount that you can put into a, a typical formulation is, is fairly limited, maybe in the order of 10, 10, 20 percent at, at, at most. But uh, often, they, they can be used to impart more hydrophobic uh, type properties to, to the foams. Um, another class of natural uh, polyols is um, uh, polyols that are made with the incorporation of carbon dioxide into the backbone. These are called uh, polycarbonate polyols. You might re uh, hear them referred to as POCO2 polyols. So um, uh, the double metal cyanide allows the carbon dioxide to react into the polymer chain, you form this carbon, uh, carbonate linkage, and that carbonate linkage is very, very rigid, and as, as a result, it, um, uh, polyols themselves tend to be very uh, highly viscous, but that rigid structure gives them uh, higher load-bearing properties than uh, conventional um, 
uh, type uh, uh, yeah, polyethers. These are, are only being have been uh, commercialized in the last uh, few years. So the other the main class of polyols that are used in flexible foam are the polyesters. Um, polyester uh, is by definition you react either a, an acid with an alcohol and remove water, or you can make it by some type of transesterification process. Again, to make a, a, a polyester, you need a bifunctional acid and a, you know, a poly, polyfunctional alcohol. Again, there's a lot of variables here where you can have either aromatic or uh, aliphatic. Um, and um, you know, typically, uh, common ones are, are based upon something like ethylene glycol and terphthalic acid. Most of these um, polyesters are difunctional. Uh, they're very, very highly viscous. Um, you know, it can easily be uh, 20,000 centipoids, whereas uh, a typical conventional polyol is only a, a few hundred centipoids. Um, they're, they're mainly used in, um, in the flexible foam area for flame lamination type, type application. Um, but, uh, one of the disadvantages of them is um, they're, they're not as hydrolytically stable that uh, ester linkage is susceptible to hydrolysis and get that reverse reaction occurring. Another family of polyols is called polymer polyols. And what polymer polyols are is a, is a stable dispersion of a solid copolymer in a liquid polyol. And there's three main commercial type of polymer polyols based upon, uh, the main one based upon styrene acryl nitrile, another was called PhD for the German polyhornstock dispersion, and the last is um, polyisocyanate, polyaddition, or I think polyamine, or piper type technology. They all have in common a component, you have a dispersing medium, which is your polyol, you have the, the, the polymer particle itself that was formed by that in situ polymerization, and you often need um, some type of stabilization either added or uh, kind of formed during the reaction. So when, uh, when, you, when you form, um, let's say, the styrene acryl nitrile ones, you, you make a special stabilizer that typically contains unsaturation, so it looks like a monomer, and then it gets chemically reacted into the polymer network, and what that steric stabilization does prevents those particles from agglomerating uh, and settling out. So unlike a filler that you put in and would almost immediately settle out, these things are fairly stable for, for years. So, um, so you know, the styrene acryl is the most common type of polymer polyol out there. Uh, again, it, it was developed you know, starting in the late uh, 60s. You can get solid content up to about 50% uh, solid and uh, you can get them both slab and molded type um, as the base polyol. Uh, the two main types out there are the high solids are typically higher styrene and they're white and they're typically very smooth type particles and depending upon the process whether it was a continuous or a semi-batch you'll get a different particle size distribution that will can affect your, um, your, your viscosity as well as uh, some of the foam uh, uh, characteristics. Um, also, there, there's some low solid types still still out there. Uh, they typically are higher acrylo. They're brown, and um, they're um, uh, typically uh, you know, not not quite as smooth. Uh, and that pop, more like popcorn shape will give them different uh, characteristics, both in viscosity and in the foam. The second type uh, of polymer polyol, as I mentioned, is the PhD, that comes from the reaction of an isocyanate with hydrazine. So essentially you're making a polyurea dispersion uh, and you, you get some in situ grafting. Typically they're fairly low solid, but uh, the, the part of uh, this is a polyurea can in, in, in involve, uh, can, can benefit by giving improved fire retardant type properties. That, uh, that last type, as I mentioned, um, the, the piper is typically used in alkanol amine, like triethanol amine. So essentially you're forming a dispersion of a, of a polyurethane in there. Then these are typically uh, lower solid content 
and they're, they're often made at the, uh, the foam plant itself. So what is the benefit of um, using a, a polymer polyol? Um, so the, the main benefit is it's kind of like if you have concrete, I mean, if you put a reinforcing filler, you're making reinforcing concrete. The same applies here. By putting those polymer particles, they get incorporated into the cell walls of the foam, make it stronger, give it higher load-bearing load properties. So this is an electron micrograph of, uh, you look at the, the, the cells here, uh, the cell wall, uh, and then you, you know, zoom in on it. You can see that the polymer particles are, are very well incorporated into the, the cell wall of, 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 the, of the foam. The uh, other main benefit is, is that uh, they can uh, provide some cell opening type uh, properties uh, to the foam, give a more uh, open cell structure. So you'll see here that uh, maybe not, not uh, all the cells are open, and uh, if you look closely, you might even uh, see a, a, a ghost uh, image in one of the, one, some of the cells there, just for Halloween. So what are the, the, the critical polymer polyol properties that you need to, uh, to worry about? Again, as I say, is, you know, the base polyol, uh, the styrene acrylo are typically in both, uh, conventional and HR. Some of the others are more on the, uh, HR type. Then you need to know what the solid content was, because that will affect your load bearing. The viscosity, again, for processing, whether those particles were smooth or rough, and what that particle size distribution was. Um, as well can uh, you know, affect you know, your processing as well as uh, you know, if you're doing a Novaflex type process can, can plug uh, some of those uh, screens or filters. Now switching to the, uh, the second main component, uh, the isocyanate. So say there, there's two uh, main classes of, of isocyanate. An isocyanate by definition is a chemical with this structure here, the nitrogen double bond carbon, double bond oxygen. The extremely reactive material, again, a polyisocyanate has to have at least two. The aromatic, the, the two uh, aromatic ones are either TDI or MDI. There's also aliphatic uh, isocyanates. They're very, very slow reacting, very, very expensive. Uh, they're good for light stable type coating applications, but they don't have that the reactivity or the cost structure to be able to be used in, in flexible foams. So the, the two aromatic ones, as I said, are TDI and MDI. And they, they really uh, uh, vary quite differently in terms of their functionality, their molecular weight, the number of products. Um, and uh, TDI exists as two isomers, a T6 and a T4. And that you, you can see what the numbering system is here. Starts out with the methyl group on the uh, aromatic ring. So you get the T4 and the, the T6 isomer. Uh, with MDI, you have uh, three monomeric isomers and a lot of uh, uh, polymeric type isomers. If we talk about the synthesis, you'll understand why. But as, as a result, for TDI, there's only three commercially available products. For MDI, there, there's many, probably at least uh, 50 MDI products out there. Functionality, for TDI, it's always going to be two, no matter which of the three products you have. For MDI, it, it, you know, it, it, it's usually at least, you know, usually at least two, but often it's, it's, high, it's higher than two and typically can go up to about, the, you know, 3.2. As a result of the differences in, uh, the molecular weight, um, you know, it will affect the percent NCO. Uh, so you can see TDI has a higher percent NCO. That means if you're going to make a foam and you want to do the same index, MDI versus TDI, on a weight basis, we need to use more MDI in that foam formulation. And lastly, the MDI is typically more reactive than uh, TDI is in, in foam formation. So, so TDI is made by starting out with uh, toluene. You then do a dinitration, uh, then a, a reduction of the nitro group to the uh, diamine, uh, and then a phosgenation to produce the T6 and the T4 uh, TDI isomers. So that, that ratio and of, of the two really comes from that first dinitration step uh, and is directed by that, that methyl group uh, in there. So um, during that, that, that synthesis, 
you always get an 80-20 ratio of the 2-4 to the 2-6. So this 80-20, or often referred to as TD80, is the most common uh, TDI um, product uh, out there. You can take that 80-20 that, uh, and do a low temperature crystallization and get out almost uh, pure solid 2-4 material, and then what you're left with is a 65-35 uh, uh, ratio. So uh, that's how you get the, the three different uh, you know, uh, products, TDI products, the TD80 directly from the process, the TD100 and the, um, the T65 through that low temperature crystallization. So almost everything, the main products in the U.S. are the TD80, T65 is used in some viscoelastic foam. It's more common uh, in Europe. And the uh, Pure Q4 is, is more used in some uh, other coating or, you know, specialty or elastomer type application than, than in flexible foams. But um, the 2.4 is the more reactive than the, than the 2.6 uh, isomer. The primary use for, for TDI is in uh, uh, flexible foams. So that's by, by far the, the, the largest, uh, money, really the only market segment for TDI as opposed to when you, you see about MDI. So MDI starts out with benzene. You do a, a mononitration and then a reduction of the nitro to, uh, to, at, to form the amine, which is aniline. You then do um, a formulation where you're doing a coupling reaction of the, these aromatic groups. And when you couple them together, you can couple them in a number of different ways to form both monomer and couple several rings together to form the polymer. So you then take this crude mixture of, of all these different monomer and polymeric amines, and then you do the phosgenation, so you end up with a mixture of um, monomer and polymeric uh, uh, MDIs, and you can separate out the monomers, and um, you usually have a mixture of, of uh, polymeric along with monomer, and on the monomer side, you can separate out the, the, the pure 4-4, four, four. the 2-4 the and the 2-2 the, the two, two usually come out uh, as, a, as a mixture. So um, the monomer side, the, the, that pure 4-4 four, four is, again, typically not used that much in, in uh, flexible foam applications. It's more used in, um, in, in as a case in, uh, in elastomer type, type applications. But the, what you're dealing with using flexible foams is, is, the, is the polymeric MDIs, PMDIs. Again, they're typically um, much darker in color, so the, the foams themselves typically, uh, or even when they're first produced, are more brown uh, in color. Uh, they're, they're often the you know, mixtures of polymers and monomers. There's probably at least 50 different uh, you know, grade of, of MDI products out there that will, you know, you know, they all have a very similar NCO content, but what they, they usually differ in is the functionality as well as that um, ratio of 2-4 uh, to 2-2 to or, or, you know, how the ratio of monomer to polymer. And again, they're, they're much, typically much higher viscosity than, uh, than, than TDI. And so the, 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 the parameters you need to, to worry about for the isocyanates, for the, for the, 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 the MDIs or viscosity, that NCO content, uh, if there was any residual acidity from, uh, the production process, because you're doing that, that phosgenation, then you need to know about what was that monomer content, the ratio of the 2-2 of the to the 2-4, again, because they have different uh, reactivities, and uh, what was that functionality. Because unlike uh, TDI, where you're getting most of that uh, cross-linking through the, through the polyol portion, with MDI, you're also getting additional cross-linking because they are higher functionality. MDI, as I mentioned, it's used in a, a wide variety of applications, not just in, uh, in polyurethane foams. It's probably one of the smaller segments. The biggest segment for, for MDI is, is uh, used in things like you know, elastomeric type, type applications. Uh, almost all rigid foam is, is MDI based from uh, you know, insulation, uh, from the roof, water heaters, refrigerators. 
uh, so then it's all, all uh, using some, using is MBI is the SSI, and it, again, because it's higher functional, is that more cross-linking. But also, MDI is a, is a great binder. Uh, you know, it, it, it binds a lot of wood products together to make particle board, slate board, and, uh, and materials like that. Now, if we look at the, the isocyanate product by the uh, end application, conventional foams are essentially exclusively all TDI based. HR foams, there is some that are based upon MDI. The majority is based upon TDI. Viscoelastic is a little bit the reverse. Most of the viscoelastic foams are MDI based rather than TDI based, but there is some actual uh, people who make foams using a blend of, uh, of TDI and MDI for viscoelastic technology. Moldy foams, again, uses both uh, isocyanate, majority being, being TDI. Before I leave the, the subject of isocyanate, uh, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the, the, the safe uh, handling of them. They, they are extremely uh, reactive material, so the pro proper precautions for uh, you know the safe use and handling of them really need to be uh, to be followed. So they have been used uh, very safely in large scale industries for for, for decades. Um, they, they they have a very very low uh, vapor pressure, but uh, you know you, you you can get overexposed to them uh, if you're not working uh, you know properly or safely. And the two main health effects are either you know, um, you know, irritation or sensitization, and the target organs are typically the, your respiratory system, your skin, um, you know, and if you're liquid, you have to worry about any splash, splash protection. Various uh, organizations like OSHA, this is the uh, American Council on General Industrial Hygiene, they have sort of set uh, safe occupational work exposure limits. What I want to point out here is these levels are in the part per billion level, so extremely you know, low, low levels there. So uh, the safe way to be, be working with them really is through your, your, your engineering controls of, of making sure that you're working in, uh, with the, the proper exhaust and the, the ventilation, that you have uh, you know, good industrial hygiene practices. You know, and lastly, that you, you do want to make sure you are wearing the proper protective uh, safety equipment you know, uh, the gloves and the, the goggles, as well as, uh, you know, one of your, your uh, occupational um, uh, safety tools that can you know, do some monitoring to determine if you would need to uh, wear a respirator or not for, for the application. So uh, the important things are to, you know, read and follow, you know, the directions on, on the safety data sheet, follow the, the recommendations from the organizations, you know, like uh, OSHA, um, and um, you know, often the, the suppliers uh, will provide uh, resources, as well as industry organizations like the PSA here provide recommendations, guidance, and assistance on the proper and safe use of, of handling the isocyanate. Last part, uh, coming to all the different uh, additives that, that are used in the formulating of the, um, the polyurethane uh, foam. What I want to point out here is typically all these additives are added to the polyol side rather than to the isocyanate side. Typically, a lot of these might have uh, groups that can react with the isocyanate. So a recommendation typically is all additives, if anything, get added to the polyol, not the isocyanate side. I mentioned that um, you know typically uh, you know to, to make the foam, you need to have a blowing agent, and typically that blowing agent comes from the reaction of water the isocyanate to generate the carbon dioxide. Um, but uh, there's kind of a, a limit there that uh, mentioned that reaction is exothermic and it uh, builds the urea structure or the hard segments. So if you want to make a really, really low density and a really, really soft foam, that's hard to do with just water. So you need to put in a, a different type of, um, of blowing agent. And the most common type is carbon dioxide gas. Um, liquid carbon dioxide, and there's various processes for adding how you add that, and they'll be talked about uh, those, those mechanisms in the, in the previous reaction, in the previous section. So, but by adding that liquid carbon dioxide, minimizing the amount of water, allows you to make lower density foam without as high of an exotherm 
and allows you to make some softer grade uh, foams. Um, in some, again, in some, some more in the developing countries, uh, you know, or in the lab, some, sometimes other, or, you know, blowing agents like acetone or methylene chloride, you know, are, are still, uh, still practiced. Uh, another, uh, one of the main components for, uh, being able to make the foams is, is the surfactants. And, um, they, they, uh, provide an awful, um, uh, lot of, uh, of, uh, control in that foaming process. And we'll talk about that more in a minute, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of, just like there's, there's all the variety of polyols out there, there's a whole variety of silicone surfactants out there. And that are all tailored to the type of uh, foam that you're making. You know, if you use the, the, the wrong type or too much of a surfactant, you know, you can either not get the, that foam to stabilize or get, get collapsed. So, you know, you need to choose the, the right surfactant and the right level of surfactant for, for the foam that you're, you're making. If you look at the steps in a foam formation, um, you, know, you, you have uh, your, your, your air interface, with the polyol, the isocyanate being the heaviest, you know, uh, you know, is on the bottom. And as you start to, to, to mix them, um, and then the, the uh, as they start to react, you're generating the gas bubbles, and then the gas bubbles um, coalesce, and that liquid is turning uh, into a semi-solid and a solid polymer. The surfactant plays a role in all those steps, from lowering the surface tension, uh, it helps emulsify all those components, it stabilizes the, those cells as they're being formed. So um, the surfactant is a is a extremely uh, critical um, component uh, in, in the foam process. And as I mentioned, there's, there's a variety of different type out there. But basically, surfactant is, is a polysiloxane backbone with a polyether side uh, side chain. And you can see you can vary the length of that polysiloxane uh, backbone. Uh, whether it's long or short, as well as the number and the length of, the, of those side chains. Again, just point out that there's, there's many different types of silicone surfactants out there, and make sure you're using the right type for the, for the, for the, the type of foam you're trying to produce, and the surfactant suppliers can all provide the, the recommendations. To mention also, the, the level of surfactant is also very critical that uh, you need to have the right amount of surfactant. If you have too little, you, you get uh, splits or even, even collapse. If you have too much surfactant, it will cause the foam to be tight and uh, you know, really shrink or prune up like, like is shown, shown here. So the other component are, uh, the, are the polyurethane catalysts, and there's specific catalysts that will catalyze the gel reaction and others that catalyze the blow reaction, and again, uh, foam formation really requires a balance of those, uh, those two reactions. So choosing that proper ratio of the catalysis is important. Typically the, the gel catalysts are tins and a few, a uh, few specific amines. Most of the amines are, are more of, of a blow catalyst. So, uh, so the gel catalysts are, are the, are the tin catalysts and, uh, materials like TETA or A33. A lot of other means like A1 is more of a blow catalyst. And a typical foam formulation, you're going to use a mix of, of, of blow catalyst and mix of, of uh, gel catalyst, uh, both, both A33 as well as, as the tin. So you're also using a, a mix depending upon the type of, uh, of foam you're trying to produce. So this is just some uh, film chemical structures of the catalyst. You said the, the, the tin catalyst is, uh, is really to help with the, the gel reaction. Again, just like the surfactant, too low a level, you're going to get the tin splits, you're not through the insufficient cross-linking. Uh, if you use too much, it's going to make the uh, foams uh, too tight, and uh, extreme cases, it, it will shrink or, or, or uh, prune up. Uh, the most common tin catalyst that's used is um, Stannis Octoweight T9. It is uh, hydrolytically unstable, so uh, that's why it typically gets last right at the very end, right before the isocyanate gets, gets added. Um, there are some formulations that use uh, T12, dibutyl tin dilorate, uh, but uh, they're still used in some systems, but uh, 
think it's, it's been pretty much uh, banned or outlawed uh, for use in, in Europe. But that is a, you know, a, a hydrolytically more stable uh, catalyst. Another class of catalyst is called the um, non-fugitive or non-emissive. As um, concerns over the, the VOCs or volatile organic compounds, uh, inflexible foams um, is becoming a, more of an a issue or importance or focus. Um, to, to avoid um, using the standard means, what the catalyst companies have developed is these uh, non-fugitive or non-emissive catalysts. There's two main ways there. One is to basically make a larger molecule a higher molecular weight so it's not as volatile. And the, the second is to, you can incorporate a functional group, there's an example shown in here, that can then react uh, and incorporate into the polymer uh, network itself. Uh, so as, a, as a result of the fact that, you know, they're either higher molecular weight or get incorporated, you typically have to uh, adjust the, the foam formulation uh, and use higher levels of, of these uh, type, type catalysts versus the standard catalyst. Another class of, uh, of amine catalysts are, are delayed action catalysts. They're often used in um, molded foams to uh, allow that the, uh, all the liquid ingredients to completely fill the mold before um, uh, starting the reaction. And um, the catalyst uh, suppliers take an amine, react it with an acid, and it forms an amine salt. So when you're using it, what you're doing is you're really adding an amine salt, and as that polymerization reaction kicks in, the heat from the, from the, uh, the exotherm makes it uh, do the reverse, generates that amine catalyst to catalyze the um, uh, polyurethane reaction. Some of the other uh, polyurethane foam components, uh, things like uh, chain extenders, uh, cross-linkers, uh, and, and other modifiers. So, you know, these are typically low molecular weight. They can be hydroxy or amine terminated, um, and they typically re react with the isocyanate to do some type of, of, of additional cross-linking reaction depending upon um, what you're trying to achieve there. You know, if you want to, maybe some of them you can be using to get better stability, or you can, uh, some of them are for making, uh, uh, having better density gradients from, from top to bottom of the foam. Uh, some, you know, will, will give uh, improved, improved cure. Some are, are put in there to give a, make a firmer or, or a harder uh, type, type foam. There's a whole, the whole variety of them out there. This is just a list of, of some of the common ones out there. And I think this really gets more into uh, the, that art portion of what I talked about earlier, knowing which one to use for, for what you're trying to do. Uh, there's no really good handbook for, for, for teaching um, you know, which one to use. I think it comes through experience and uh, training on your colleagues. The same thing for the, the, the very so open or the so modifiers. There's a whole range of, of those type products out there. And like, like all these components, they, they're either in an aqueous or a glycol solution. They also contain hydroxyl groups. So you need to account for the, any of that water uh, and the hydroxyl in your, your, your uh, index calculation. Fillers are also sometimes uh, used. Um, if you're just using a filler like a calcium carbonate, uh, you're typically putting something like that in to uh, make it a higher density and lower the cost. Generally, fillers uh, hurt foam, uh, foam properties. There are some um, fire retardant uh, fillers, like barium, uh, sorry, like uh, uh, aluminum hydroxide and antimony or melamine that are put in specifically to achieve uh, fire retardant properties. Many of these fillers will affect the reactivity, so you know you, if, you're, if you're either adding them in or taking them out, you need to worry and may be able to adjust your catalysis for that. Uh, that effect. So a little bit more about besides those solid fire retardant fillers, there's also liquid fire retardant fillers. Uh, again, a whole variety of different types out there, depending upon the type of um, foam test that you want to want to try to pass. Uh, so a lot of recent legislation change in some of the procedures. Uh, the use of fire retardants in foams has been uh, 
a significantly uh, decrease. Uh, so just to be, be, again, cautious like fillers. If you're taking them out or putting them in a foam formulation, you, you probably will have to adjust the foam formulation to account for that uh, acidity that was either there or would come in with the fire retardant. Another material that's often used nowadays in the viscoelastic foams are the gels or the polymer control agents. And what these are are materials that can affect the heat capacity of, of the foam. For example, some of the phase change materials um, you know, might be things like, like a wax, a solid wax that's micro-encapsulated. And what it does is it, it absorbs the heat from the body and changes from that solid to the liquid. And then um, you know, after uh, you know, sleeping on it, it will change back from, from the liquid to the solid to be ready to sort of start that cycle over again. But, um, so nowadays, you, 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 almost all visco foams you see with memory gel beads and um, phase change materials. Uh, you know, they can be incorporated, you know, in uh, through the whole foam or put on a, as a, as a layer on top. There's a whole variety of different type of classes of these, these gel beads. Often flexible foams are, are pigmented. Um, for uh, uh, sometimes for, for grade identification or for certain end use uh, applications, the, that can be either either uh, uh, inorganic pigment, but more common is uh, organic uh, uh, type dye material that has some functional group on it, like those reactive catalysts I mentioned, that it can then react with the isocyanate and be chemically incorporated into the into the foam. Uh, another important ingredient is the, the antioxidant, as I mentioned earlier. Typically, during the polyol manufacturing process, the manufacturer adds the antioxidant uh, in depending upon the, the end use application. So, it, but if you're going to be trying to use um, a, a non, non uh, slab foam into a slab application, you need to worry about um, making sure that the uh, right antioxidant level uh, is, is present by either measuring or adding uh, additional antioxidants. Uh, I mentioned that, that foam reaction is extremely exothermic and those buns can uh, you know, ignite or decompose. Uh, and people have set uh, foam plants on, on fire from uh, a, a result of that. So, so the most common antioxidants are, are sterically hindered phenols, and uh, uh, aromatic um, you know, diamines are the most, most common types in there. Uh, so you know, they're, they're, they're you know, you know, used to, to uh, everything from the polyol stabilization, uh, prevent any odor bodies, prevent peroxides, as well as prevent uh, you know, scorch or the, the discoloration in the foam bun, um, or worse, um, that, that uh, exotherm uh, being getting too hot and the, the foam catching on fire. We really do need to, to make sure that we verify that antioxidant level as well as calculate what that maximum exotherm is. There's a limit to the amount of, of water that can be, be put in to a foam formulation without that foam catching on fire. And uh, the lastly here is the, uh, you know, there's a lot of other additives like anti-static agents. We're trying to make some special type foams from say clothing or, or, or shoes. Uh, if you're trying to make foam that's used for, uh, say, like, like uh, in, in warm, humid conditions, like uh, outdoor furniture, you want to make uh, maybe have an antimicrobial or biocide. There's a whole variety of different types of, of additives in there. And uh, again, like a lot of these things, these additives, you know, can affect the you know, reactivity. So you need to verify what that reactivity is on a small scale before, you know, uh, going into production with it. So we, you know, we discussed a whole variety of, 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 of all the materials that go into the, the flexible foam. Um, and there, there's many effects there. As I said, a lot of it is, is an art. But the, you know, the science part. I hope I've uh, told you, uh, you know, the, the, uh, enough to get you get you started in it. But I would say use the resources of the suppliers. All the suppliers can easily make specific recommendations on best how to how to use their their products. 